We'll have 13 seconds. All right. Just put to me. Welcome to Q&A with QA, where the ACX Quality Assurance Team discusses audio topics and takes questions from ACX producers like you. I'm here with David and Mike from the ACX QA team. What's up, guys? Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. How are you Thank doing you. today? Pretty good. I'm doing good. Me too. Ready to help some ACX producers understand how to master with effects processing? Absolutely. All right, let's do this. This episode is actually part two of our three-part post-production roadmap series. In part one, we covered file organization, and we got familiar with some foundational editing techniques. So if you've not watched that episode, once you finish watching this one, go back and watch that so you can understand how it all fits in together. Today we're going to focus on effects processing and mastering. Whether you're trying to correct a recording issue or you're looking to add a hint of sweetener to your audio, we've got you covered. Our QA team is made up of audio experts, and they'll explain techniques they use when they do recording and production on their own that will help you achieve a professional sounding audiobook and will offer advice on what processes you should be focusing on. And then, of course, because this is Q&A with QA, we'll take your questions at the end of the episode. That's right. So let's get right into it, guys. Uh, our first segment is covering the, the high-level stuff about mastering and effects processing. David, kick us off. What is mastering? I know a lot of ACX producers, it's this big, scary thing that, that is, seems hard to crack. What is mastering? Right. Um, so mastering is really the final stage in the post-production process. Um, it's, it acts as a final uh, QC check. Uh, for any audio restoration that you might want to do for any audio deficiencies that you might have missed within the editing stage. Um, and it's also the process of adding that, that final sonic polish to your audio uh, to ensure that your audio sounds its best on all platforms. Um, it's, it's really like, you know, uh, detailing a car, getting it show ready, adding the frosting to the cake or stuff, you know, it's that final. That I like final, those analogies. Yeah, that cherry, that cherry on the top. The cherry on the sun, yeah. the frosting on the cake, and detailing on the car. Don't, right. don't mix those up and put right. frosting on your car. Um, okay, so now that we understand what it is, uh, the first step in our mastering process actually takes place before you're sitting in front of your DAW, before you press any buttons. Mike, what's that first step? Well, the first step in mastering is getting used to critically thinking, uh, critically listening to uh, audio to figure out what you're trying to accomplish when you're mastering. Uh, for this, we recommend finding some, some reference material um, of other narrators that you like who, whose voices are in a similar frequency range as yours and who maybe narrate a similar genre to what you're doing. And um, we focus on three aspects of the sound. Uh, the first is which is tonal balance. This is how your audio is represented in the, fre in the frequency spectrum. So this includes, in a basic sense, the lows, the mids, and the highs of your audio. Uh, this is where you try to, um, you'll, you try to achieve um, a natural representation of your voice and maybe highlight <coughs> which aspects of it that you like about it. Um, the second in which is noise. Uh, you're going to listen for it, it, what, where the level of your noise floor is at, if there's anything in the background that you want to remove from your signal. And then finally, dynamics, uh, the dynamic range and the overall loudness of your signal. Um, this is where you'll try to achieve um, a balance in levels so that your audio all comes across in a consistent level and um, creates uh, cohesion uh, from the beginning of your audiobook to the end of it. So right. that makes a ton of sense. Learn about your own voice, learn about what you like and don't like in others' voice uh, to just sort of inform, give you that base level of what you're going for. Um, and just to be clear, when you talk about gathering reference material, they. Uh, Producers really should be focusing on audiobooks specifically, right? E even other forms of VO and stuff may have right. different. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so auto the Audible Marketplace offers a free sample with every book uh, that's available, and we highly suggest you know just gathering a bunch of samples and listening back to them and listening to these three different aspects um, with a critical ear, um, especially listening. especially the dynamics and overall loudness. Mm -hmm. uh, you really want to measure the the loud parts with the quiet parts and. Really listen to that transition. Is there any harshness there? Is there any? Um, is it a smooth transition? And really compare it to your to your audio file. All right. And so we'll we'll get into shortly how to fix some of those or improve some of that once you recognize what's going on there. Right. Um, and we'll do that with a, a mastering chain. And so can you tell me what is what's a typical mastering chain and what's it made up of? Right. So a typical mastering chain is going to include an EQ, a compressor, and a limiter. Um, we, I personally like to follow that order um, in series. Um, 
again, mastering is a complex process. It's there's no fixed way um, on how to place these effects in whatever order. Um, but this is just my personal approach, and we'll go back. We'll I'll, I'll get into the details as to why I choose to EQ pre-compression or EQ post-compression. Um, but your typical mastering chain will include these three tools, and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you might not need all of them. We're, we're recommending, by and large, for audiobooks, you'll use this chain, um, right. but you don't always need all of them, and you don't always need to do all of them in the same order. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, so our next question up, uh, now that we understand the generalities of mastering, um, let's get into the first step, which is effects processing with equalization. Right. Um, Mike, what is EQ? What is it used for? So EQ is a way of changing the signal level of certain frequencies without affecting um, other frequencies. For instance, um, probably the most basic uh, way um, uh, of e EQ that we know is on, on a stereo of the bass and treble knobs on a stereo. Uh, it allows you to turn up the bass without turning down the treble, etc. Um, on a, your EQ, your EQ plug-in and your DAW allows you to do that and also a lot more. You can apply it to uh, several different points in the fre frequency spectrum. You can attenuate different things that you either like or don't like. If there's too much bass, you can turn the bass down. You can, um, you can add sibilance or add definition to, to your vocal if you like. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and you can also use it as, as, a, as a corrective tool if you find any aspects of your audio. Um, you know, with, with errors in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, li I like that analogy of, of, the of the stereo knobs, the bass and the treble, I think. We've all probably gone there and, and turned the bass all the way up to hear what it sounds like or turned the treble all the way down to hear that far away sound. And so um, EQ is, is really doing that in a much more fine-tuned way than kind of the dumb way of just bass and treble. Right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so David, what, what, what are the basic anatomy and functions of an EQ? What, what makes up what we're going to be working on here? Right, so um, as you can see, we've used an image of a five-band parametric EQ. Um, and these are the parameters that you're going to find on every parametric EQ. And so uh, following this list, we're going to start with the Q setting. The Q setting allows you to select uh, the specific range of frequencies that are going to be treated, um, whether you're cutting or boosting. The uh, second parameter is the frequency control. This uh, will allow you to set the specific frequency that's being uh, emphasized or attenuated. And three is your gain knob. Um, this is pretty straightforward. It's whether you're, it's the control on whether you're boosting or you're reducing the volume of that specific frequency. And then you have your filters. You have your high pass, your low pass, notch filters, band pass, shelving. It's a lot of filters. It's a lot of filters, yes. All right. <laughs> um, that, that's a great look at what makes up our EQ anatomy and functions. Um, one way to use them that you've told me about is su subtractive EQ. Um, right. What is that specifically, and how is it different from other ways of using EQ? Yeah, um, well, the subtractive EQ approach really uh, ties back to our typical mastering chain and uh, how, I placed, how I like to place my EQ pre-compression. Um, I'm always, whenever I approach a project uh, that I'm mastering, I always look to remove any unwanted frequencies uh, from the signal. And um, because you'd be surprised that by stripping out any unwanted sounds or noise, you're actually enhancing your signal. You're, you're adding more clarity to it without having to boost anything. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> That's a really good point because I think. I hear from a lot of people out there that think mastering is usually additive and you're, you're right. sweetening the sound by yeah. laying something on top of it or processing it in some additive way, but it's good to know. Yeah, and there, there's, certain, there's certain circumstances where you might want to take that, added, mm -hmm. that additive approach and add a little presence to your vocal, but if you are going to do that, if you are choosing to do that, then I suggest inserting another EQ post-compression. Now, the reason for this is any... Any frequencies that you emphasize pre-compression is going to impact how that compressor behaves, mm -hmm. and it's going to change the uh, the tone of your signal. Um, so you may need to review that right. again. Right, and again, in the, in the audio community, you know, there's people who like to, uh, you know, add frequencies before compressing mm -hmm. or after. So it's uh, it's really it's really subjective. It's really a preference. So um, I suggest everybody to uh, conduct your own research on it and see what works best for you. Yeah, that's great. And this, this, this is a starting place. This is a guide for how to do it. And uh, you guys use this method yourselves in your personal um, audio production. Yeah. Uh, so we'll focus on this. But yeah, do your own research. There are other additional ways that, that you could be doing this. Um, Mike, David mentioned high pass and low pass filters earlier. Uh, help us understand what those are. Sure. So um, high pass and low pass filters are they're kind of broad ways 
of cutting off a large uh, portion of the frequency spectrum. So a high pass filter will, um, will prevent all, all the low frequencies up until a specific point um, from re being removed from the audio and vice versa. A low pass filter will prevent high frequencies from, from coming through your signal. And um, these, are good, these are good to use in narration because a lot of times um, just noise will occur on, in the, the very low and the very high sections of an audio signal. And it doesn't really add much to to the to the, the final master. Yeah, yeah. To, except distraction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what it does is it is it, it it takes up headroom in your audio signal, so that when you go to to raise the volume, um, those frequencies are are occupying some of that level, and you won't be able to turn up the the frequencies that you want to. Right. And so, what are just a couple quick examples, uh, David, of some of those higher range frequencies that would be problematic and, and some lower just you know yeah some some high idea. end uh, hiss that might that might be in your recording uh, a high pitched frequency tone that could be cutting through the narration um, it could be um, something within your recording environment that's causing uh, some high frequency some high frequency noise mm -hmm. um, again on the other side of the spectrum you have low end rumble that can be caused by any electrical appliances that you're surrounded by when you're recording at home. Um, uh, maybe a truck that drove by during your recording, or you know, stuff that like that. that. that yeah. I, think, I think that paints a good picture. Of what you're Fre trying frequencies to that contribute where? nothing to the final master. That's, Rogue that's really what it is. Right, yeah. Rogue, <laughs> Rogue frequencies. frequencies yes. I like that term. Um, so, uh, in order to get rid of those, uh, can we talk about the, the sweeping technique? I know this is something that you use yeah. um, and something that would be beneficial for other ACX producers. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, um, so sticking with the subtractive EQ approach, um, I like to use this technique called the sweeping technique. And what this is, it's, it's a great way to identify problematic frequencies by actually first boosting and emphasizing that frequency. So what you want to do is you want to dial in the appropriate Q setting, um, which is a narrow Q setting. So that's going to be a low Q setting. Um, and what you want to do is you want to sweep across the frequency spectrum until you've identified that, that problematic frequency. And it's definitely going to jump out at you because, again, we're, we're, we're increasing the, the volume of these frequencies right. by 20 dB. So it's definitely going to jump out at you. And once you've identified and located that frequency, you then uh, reduce the volume. Uh, narrow down that Q to, uh, you want to affect as little of, the, uh, as little of frequency range as you can. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not... So attenuating you're, so you're not of affecting your voice yeah right so you're not you're not stripping any any um, uh, qualities from your yeah. vocal performance and this is good for um, mm -hmm. for extraneous noise or anything like that but also for if you're trying to eliminate some sibilance from your audio or some plosives or any, you know anything that that um, that that is sort of detracting from the quality of your sound right. um, you can use this to identify the offending frequencies and then attenuate them mm -hmm. as you see fit the yeah. offending rogue frequencies. Yeah, that's right. I think they're playing down the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that we understand uh, all of that, um, Mike, as we're, we're doing this kind of um, EQ, what are some frequency ranges that producers might want to pay attention to and what sort of lives in those frequency ranges? Sure. So um, as, you, as you start to learn to, to use EQ, you'll start to think of your, your voice as occupying uh, different ranges in, in the frequency spectrum. Uh, typically, sibilant sounds. Will, um, will occur between uh, 6 kilohertz and 11 kilohertz. Uh, nasal frequencies will be between 900 hertz and 1K. And then uh, gen the general body of the vocal will be between 250 hertz and 600 hertz. And this is going to be different for uh, male and female vocalists mm -hmm. and for voice type. Um, but these are sort of some general places to start when you're learning to EQ your voice. Right. I like to think of it as kind of, uh, as kind of like a road map. Mm -hmm. uh, of the frequency spectrum, we're uh, essentially pointing you in, into the right direction. If you if you do hear these these free, these uh, vocal qualities in your recording, then you know use these settings as a as a starting point. Yeah. So these settings are a roadmap within this episode, which is the post production roadmap. Yeah, so right. it's like a next level roadmap. Yeah. All sure. right. Cool. Hopefully everybody can follow that <laughs> the inception of of this mastering yeah. uh, and effects processing. Uh, so our final two steps here, as we we pivot away from EQ and mm -hmm. we get more into um, compression and limiting, those are considered dynamics processing. Um, Mike, can you help us understand what that is specifically? Sure. So in an audio signal, the the difference between the loudest parts of the signal and the, and the quietest is known as the dynamic range. Um, 
Now, when, uh, when you narrate a book, when you're doing different sort of dramatic takes, different characters, you're going to have different volumes. And we use dynamics processing to, to sort of control those volumes to make it more consistent so that it's not, um, so that you don't have really loud passages next to really quiet. You have a more consistent sort of level. And so the way we, as experimenting with our stereo, might have been reaching for the bass and treble knobs, we don't want listeners reaching for the volume knob. Constantly, right. if an action scene comes along and the book is blowing out their ears, or there's, right. a, there's a really subtle dialogue and it's too low to hear. So we're just kind of moving everything within. Right. I think within a lot band. of times that goes unnoticed uh, whenever someone's listening to an audiobook or watching a film or listening to music is during those loud passages and quiet passages um, of the performance, mm -hmm. Uh, you're not. You're never reaching for that volume knob, and that's that's really a direct result of compression being applied to the signal. So it's one of those things where if you notice it, if people notice it, you might have done something wrong. It's right. Like you're going to mastering hear it. works best when nobody. Right. If you if you, uh, yeah. Right. yeah. If you've gone too far, you're definitely you're going to start to hear like a pumping effect. Huh. Um, that's yeah, and that that's a negative thing. That's, that's yeah. not something you want your. That's yeah. not, the focus that's should be you on your, your audio to fantastic yeah. narration, yeah. Right? Yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, so, okay, uh, a compressor, Mike. Uh, how does it treat an audio signal? Sure. So, um, so a, a compressor works by restricting signal level. Um, it, sometimes it's a misconception that compressors make audio louder. They actually make it quieter. Um, they, you'll, uh, it, it limits, it limits the peak levels of a signal and brings it down so that it's closer to the rest of the signal, um, which we talk often about peak and RMS levels. Uh, by using a compressor, you can, you can limit the, the peak level so that you can then create headroom again and then um, raise the RMS level of, of the overall file. Right. And just, just for, for the basic, uh, our most beginner viewers out there, headroom is going to be the space you have to make things louder before uh, you, you, you're hitting distortion or running afoul of our Right, audio exactly, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, in digital audio, we, just, we, have, we have a finite level of how much signal we can put into it. And if you have very dynamic audio with really loud peaks, but then very quiet parts, you're going to run out of headroom really quickly. Right. So using a compressor is a good way to... Change, it changes the relationship between your peak level and your average signal level. And you're yeah. bringing them closer together. That's essentially what you're doing. Right. Um, and, and then with makeup gain, sorry to cut you off no, there. No, no, please. Um, and then with makeup gain, you can make your track overall, uh, you can increase the volume of mm -hmm. your track um, by lifting the entire signal without changing that relationship between the peaks and, uh, and the quiet parts. Yeah. All right. And, and what I was going to ask was Mike mentioned both uh, peaks and RMS, and sometimes I hear confusion uh, from producers about what's the difference between the two. Can mm. you quickly help us understand that? Well, uh, the RMS is is really that average signal level. It's mm -hmm. really um, where your signal um, is sitting across the entire performance for the for the most of the duration right. of the audio. So when you so when you analyze mm -hmm. a file for RMS, you're you're taking this like a selection of of an entire audio file, and it's basically calculating. Um, that between the highest and the, and the loudest, uh, the loudest and the quietest parts of the audio signal. I see. So our requirements for peaks, it sounds like, make sure that there's no one specific word or sentence that's way too loud. And our requirements for RMS, I hope I'm, I hope I'm getting this because it means we're all doing a good job. Is mm -hmm. um, it's making sure that everything in that chapter or file is sitting in the proper range overall. Right. Right. All right. Yeah. Hey, I got it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we understand a compressor. We understand peak versus RMS. Um, what are what are the parts of the compressor? What are the anatomy and functions? Just like we looked at for the EQ. Sure. So um, a few a few basic functions of a compressor. Um, the first of which is a threshold. So this is this is the signal level in which the compressor will begin to work. So in the example that we have, it shows the threshold being at negative 10 dB. So any any signal above negative 10. Um, will be compressed, whereas any signal level below negative 10 will not be touched by the compressor. Um, now, the way that we um, the way that we determine how much compression is applied is known as the ratio. Um, typically, a lower ratio is less compression, and the higher the more you increase the ratio is the is the more severe the compression will be applied. Um, with narration, it's good to start with a low ratio, um, and to turn it up as as you start to hear the compression start to work and how it affects the tone and um, you know the signal level. Um, right, ratio is really the difference in input level to output level. 
um, it's really, um, for an example, if you're getting 3 dB reduction on your peaks and you're set to a 3-1 ratio, you're going to get 1 dB output out of that peak. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's an, it's an automated volume control, yep. really. All right. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And so our next part is gain reduction. That's right. So this just shows you how much, um, how much gain is being reduced from the audio signal. Um, if you see on the meter, it, it's kind of, it looks the opposite of a typical meter, whereas um, you know, the signal is displayed from, from bottom to top. This is the opposite because it's actually taking gain away from your audio signal. Um, and then the final one is makeup gain, and this is where you can apply um, gain back to your signal. So you've compressed it, you've, you've brought down the peak level, you have a more consistent level, now you can turn up the overall level to increase your RMS mm. by using makeup gain. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so what I'm getting is that our first step in our process, EQ, is for removing unwanted sounds, frequencies, yep. uh, adding a little bit, highlighting the, the aspects that you do want, like mm -hmm. maybe a rich bassness in the voice or something like that. Yep. Uh, that's the point of the EQ. From there, um, the compressor will just make sure that everything is, is within the right range. Nothing's too quiet, nothing's too loud, and there's not a lot of space in between. Yeah. Right. All right. And so once we've done that, we move on to the third part of our process, which is limiting. Um, what does that do to an audio signal? Uh, well, a limiter is really, it's a compressor, and it acts as really a, a safety net to ensuring that no peaks are going to cross a set uh, dB level, whatever, whatever dB level that you have your compressor set to. Um, because with a compressor, you're controlling the dynamic range, you're controlling the peaks, you're taming them by reducing the volume by uh, whatever reduction you have set in your ratio, um, and you're creating headroom. But sometimes, when for really loud peaks, those can still sneak, um, sneak past uh, the compressor and cause digital distortion, clipping. And so a limiter is really just that, that, uh, that safety net and just setting a brick wall to, to basically to just prevent any audio from causing any digital distortion or clipping. Yeah. Okay, all right. And so uh, that that third part in the process. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, please tell, I, please tell I me just, more. I just remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> with that, you're also um, it's giving you another opportunity to make your track louder. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, you can. That's another opportunity for you to bring up your average signal level, your RMS, and you want to make sure you're referencing it with commercially released material. That way, um, your audiobook can compete in the marketplace. On a professional level, yeah, yeah we want we want everything mm -hmm. to sort of everything through ACX to stand shoulder to shoulder. Nobody should be saying, "Oh, this sounds like an ACX production." Actually, gotcha. the only time they should say that is when it sounds awesome, right? right? Yeah, there you go. That sounds That's like an ACX production. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so just sort of uh, wrapping everything up here. Um, uh, I know we have a, a little bit of comparison up. Uh, just to round that off, we, we've made the audio sound good. We've gotten rid of the bad rogue frequencies. We've highlighted the, <clears throat> the good frequencies. Um, we've brought everything into a range so that um, nothing's too loud and nothing's too quiet. Mm -hmm. And then once we've done that, our final step does make everything louder, but ensures that it's not too dynamic right. and that it's not going beyond our audio requirements and, and right. um, you know sounding bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So so that is our run through of uh, mastering with effects processing and our, our processing chain. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope that you learned quite a bit from it. Um, the learning is not over, however. Uh, we're going to get into the Q&A with QA at this point. We've got both uh, some questions that were submitted in advance on acxuniversity.com, uh, as well as um, some questions that we're going to take live from our audience right here now. Awesome. So are we ready to get into it? Yes, we are. All right, let's do it. Our first question is from Diane. Diane asks, do you run each process that we've covered here separately, or do you set up a template that somehow runs them all at the same time? David? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question. It's a good question. Um, we, I typically like to run my mastering chain in series, so my plugins follow that order that were presented in the slide, um, one at a time. Um, I know most uh, recording softwares you can set a mastering chain. Um, so what you want to do is, if once when you're using these tools, you want to save uh, whatever setting you've you've settled on. So that way you can create a mastering chain. You can recall those settings and create a mastering chain that you can reuse in future productions. But even if you do that, it's still applying those processes in order as in, we discuss them, right? Not all in, simultaneously. In whatever order you choose to place those tools, yeah. Right, because each mm -hmm. each one you do subsequently will, will, each one you do first will affect 
how the, how the, the other one. behaves. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Okay, so they can be run in order, they can be run in like a, an automated batch together, right. but not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's good to, to, to preview each section as you're working through it, um, because you're going to want to see, you know, maybe your EQ file sounds really great, but then if you do apply a compressor, it's going to change the way it sounds, so you mm -hmm. want to make sure that everything's kind of working together in a, in a nice way. And so now, I'm, I'm curious, is there ever a situation where a producer can say, you know what, I'm, I have the same voice, I have the same home studio, I'm always recording in the same environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, can, can I just set it and forget it? Do I need to be listening to every production? Does it ever get to that place, or are, are there other changes that producers might not be aware of? I think it takes a lot of uh, years of experience to get to that point where your performance is that consistent, mm -hmm. where you you could potentially just batch process all your files and not have to think about it. Um, but if you're like most producers who are just starting out, you really you really want to take the time to to listen to every file and take your time with the process. It takes it takes a lot of experience. It takes years of practice, trial and error. All right, so that yeah. can that can be like a long term goal. Yeah, to sure. Potentially yeah, yeah. get to that. Absolutely, yeah. There you go. Um, all right, so let's let's jump to a question from our live audience. Um, Michelle asks, can reverb be fixed in post-production? So I guess if there's reverb in the recording, sure. how do you deal with that in post-production? That's a tough one. It's, uh, um, you, you really want to strive for, for getting a nice focused sound at the get-go. Um, if you think about it, your microphone is, is it's picking up your environment um, as much as it is your voice. So you really want to create a, a, a quiet, Tight environment so that you can have, um, you know, just 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 a really immediate close vocal sound, because uh, there's not a ton you can do to reduce reverb in post production. Right, Th those that type of issue has to be addressed in pre production, mm -hmm. and and we actually have a great video on how to pass QA every time where we go into tips and tricks on on and solutions on what you can do to address uh, such a problem with your recording environment. And th that's a general theme with audiobook production is that it, you really should be trying to take care of problematic issues right. in your recording phase, maybe in your yeah. editing phase, but early on in the process. Yeah. As we've yeah. described, mastering is, yeah. is Mastering is the fun part. It's, yeah. it's the fun part. All right. Uh, it's, it's, it's the process that involves, um, I would say, to compare it with the other. You have to spend more time with the pre-production. You, you really want to take your time with setting up a proper environment, setting up your mic, your mic properly. Um, and then that way, when you get to the mastering stage, it could be a lot more creative than, you know, than correcting a bunch of issues. Yeah. And, and that's what seems like it would make it fun, is, is the creativity of putting the, the cherry on top, as you yeah. said, yeah. instead yeah. of scooping out the, uh, the right. steak that accidentally fell in exactly. the Exactly. Yeah. There you go. That's an analogy that totally <laughs> makes sense. Um, <laughs> recovering from that, Matthew would like to know, if you could please discuss aftermarket plugins, are they really that much better than what comes with the DAW? Are they worth it? Sure. Um, so I think I think it's it's a good way to think about these plugins, these effects as tools. Um, the best thing you can do is learn how to use it um, to its most effective ability. Um, because essentially, I mean, an, an EQ uh, plugin that comes with your DAW, um, it's, it's the, the the functionality of it is going to be very similar to a more expensive EQ that you can go out and buy. Um, you know, like an aftermarket thing. Yeah. And um, uh, once you learn how to use the tools to, to their best ability, um, you may find that you want more features or, you know, some... A certain some uh, tone, sonic tone, because that's what a lot of these aftermarket plugins offer, is they color the sound in a certain way. And, uh, yeah, we, we always uh, encourage producers to really um, buckle down and really grasp the, the, the foundational concept um, of EQ and compression and, and really getting familiar with the, the controls and the functions um, because then that way once you do make that decision to go and purchase an aftermarket plugin or a third party um, then you can really appreciate it for what it what it brings to your audio. Mm -hmm. Crawl before so. you walk. Yeah. All right. Definitely. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so jumping over to another live question from our audience, Eric Turner would like to know when he should use noise reduction. Uh, he's having difficulty removing hum from his recordings. Uh, so again, I guess something that's in the recording that he doesn't want, would noise reduction be a good fix for that? Hmm. Um, I'll say a better fix is to, okay. is to find what the source of the noise is from the beginning. Um, if it's an environmental sound or if it's um, some sort of electrical issue with your, with your recording software or hardware, I should say. Um, the best thing to do is to try to remove it 
from the get-go, so you don't have to affect your sound at all in post-production. Well, let's say Eric's, let's say that's too late for that for Eric. Let's say poor Eric has no choice but to try to use noise reduction to get rid of that hum. Is it mm. possible? Is it advisable? Anything to be aware of? Um, well, noise reduction used excessively can really uh, introduce um, some like digital uh, noise kind of and makes the vocal sound uh, unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, kind of kind of like robotic almost a yeah. little bit if, if used excessively. But um, a good way to kind of try to identify um, the noise is to use the sweeping technique on your sure, EQ yeah. tool and um, if, it, if it is only if it's only occupying a small uh, band of the frequency range, um, you might just be able to scoop it out without really affecting um, your vocal. To go to go back to that question, mm -hmm. uh, w does it say what kind of mic he's using? I don't believe it does. Okay. If he's still in the live chat, we may right. be able to figure out that information later. Okay. But if not... Um, right. Well, every microphone is going to introduce a certain amount of mechanical noise. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on what kind of mic he's using, um, there are certain types of mics that introduce more noise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm speaking based on my own experience. I know USB microphones tend to be tend to be pretty loud mm -hmm. um, compared to traditional condenser microphones not loud um, for your voice but loud with the no, what just they it, introduced and yeah, what they yeah. introduced to the signal mm -hmm. yeah self noise right. exactly right. okay yeah. all right so uh, usb mics can be used but maybe upgrade yeah. as soon as you're able is kind of a good idea sure yeah right. i mean yeah when you're willing to take that step up um, yeah Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, so perhaps we'll find out more from Eric there, but we will move on um, to Ray, who would like to know what the easiest way to reduce mouth noises, and, mouth noises and small breaths without sacrificing vocal quality when processing an audio file. Mike, mm. thoughts? Um, it's an editing question. Yeah, I yeah. think I think I think this uh, um, that that should be referenced in when during during the editing process. Figure out. Um, um, you you may want to use uh, vocal uh, uh, automation. I suggest to lower using the volume. vocal automation. Yeah, definitely. As opposed to, I know some producers out there will um, have a clip of room tone and then uh, select a specific amount and then copy and paste every, a room tone in in between each passage, and that's super time consuming. Um, sure, volume automation is time consuming as well, but it's gonna it's gonna provide a more natural. Uh, result in in the in the performance, and again, you don't want to remove too much breath mm -hmm. um, because then your performance is going to sound unnatural. Um, so you do want to keep a little bit of breath, and automation is a great way of controlling that that amount of breath that you want to include in the recording. Yeah. So we've I got agree. two ways that you might sound like a robot. One is if you overuse yeah. noise reduction, <laughs> and the other is if you take out too many breaths. Mm. Yeah. So don't end up sp sounding like a sort of text-to-speech program. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Avoid those right. two uh, pitfalls. And, and there's also um, one feature that a lot of softwares offer is uh, strip silence. I know Pro Tools offers it. I know Reaper has something similar. Um, so, uh, but that that's that can get really complex. So, if you, if you choose to want to look into that, then you know I highly encourage it, mm -hmm. and that could that could help you out with that. Now, is uh, is strip silence what sort of removes all the noise and goes down to like that digital black? Right. So it'll it'll strip all of the uh, the silence in between passages. Right. So uh, people who tend to use this option will will use it, but they'll have a clean room tone track. Right. right. I was going to say that way. Yeah. Yeah. That way you'll you'll highlight the room tone and then you just click and drag and it'll automatically trim that room tone track and okay. insert clean room tone in between your takes. All right. But again, you risk um, removing some wanted breaths right. in the performance. So. And sounding like a robot, and which sounding, is not what yeah. we want. Sounding yeah. choppy, yeah. Eric checked back in with us. I assume Eric is not a robot. Hopefully he's not. <laughs> um, he says he's using a Cade 100S. Really putting you guys on the spot here. Cade uh, not sure if that's a mic that you're familiar with or I'm if that not. helps you answer the question better. But maybe there's another viewer out there who is a little bit more familiar with it who wants to jump over in the YouTube chat and, and share their thoughts with Eric. Mm. Um, in the meantime, we have a couple more questions before we're going to wrap up. Um, sure. Teresa would like to know, how do you eliminate plosives and S's using equalization or compression? Sure. Yeah, um, uh, I would use EQ for, for both of these issues. Um, uh, plosives occur usually as a as a as a buildup of bass frequencies, uh, typically from from uh, the proximity effect of speaking too close to a microphone, um, and these can usually be attenuated using a high pass filter, or um, going in and just lowering some some low frequency um, uh, from your audio signal. Mm -hmm. 
And then on the contrary, this uh, sibilance lives more in the high frequency range and typically occurs in a more narrow uh, frequency band. So in this case, I would go in and use a sweeping technique to find where it's at and then attenuate it, whether, whether you bring it all the way down or just lower it to, um, s to a volume where, where it sounds more balanced in the rest of your audio. Yeah. All right. And so speaking of balanced, I'd like to close on a question about music uh, from Jeff, who would like to know what is the best way to add music to ACX files, uh, either within opening credits uh, or in the beginning and end of chapters. Uh, balance may not have been obvious there, but I guess I was thinking balance between music and narration. Just sure. wanted to close that loop for any viewers that were like, what is he talking about, <laughs> balanced? Anyway, <laughs> now that I'm done with that, um, yeah. what would you recommend in terms of uh, music um, in, in audiobook files? Uh, sure. Well, I'm not going to say that there's one best way on how to do it. I can give you um, some things to consider when you're adding music to your audiobook. Um, first things first, you've got to make sure that you, have, you own the rights to use uh, this music if it's if it's copywritten mm -hmm. um, and you also want to make sure that your music is on a separate track the reason I recommend this is it gives you independent volume control when you're mixing your vocal take with the music so that way the music isn't overpowering the performance mm -hmm. um, and and last but not least you want to make sure that the transition uh, between files between sections in your audiobook are smooth yeah. So you want to add some fades at the t at the heads of your files and at the tail end. Yeah. And here too might be a good place to try to use EQ. Uh, there may be competing frequencies in the music mm. and your voice, and a good way to kind of make room for your voice right. is to uh, attenuate some of those frequencies in the music. I think that's a great way to loop back around to everything that we've been talking about, bringing EQ back in. Mm. Um, thanks so much for for joining us today. Thank um, you, man. Sure, I thanks. learned a lot. I hope all of you learned a lot. Um, as I said, uh, we've got a ton, we've got a wealth of information on audiobook production, editing, studio setup, mastering, all of that, uh, both on our YouTube channel and on the ACX blog. Uh, so we'll drop some links uh, that are relevant and what Dave mentioned into the description of this YouTube video. Go back and watch part one now that you've completed part two, and then I guess you got to watch part two again so that yeah. they go together in the right order. Um, and check in back with us soon because, as I said, this is part two of our three-part roadmap series. Right. And so we'll drop that third part and complete the loop, and then from there, we'll, we'll figure out where our roadmap right. within a roadmap takes us. Thanks, Scott. All this right. was a lot of fun. I agree. Thanks, I guys. hope you all yeah. agreed, too. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.